Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to show you how to install a Red Hat 7 virtual machine and VMware workstation. So the first thing we're going to do is open our software. We're going to create a new virtual machine. I'm going to tell it's currently compatible and then I'm going to install the operating system later. I'm going to do a Red Hat Linux virtual machine 7 64-bit and I'm going to call this one Alliance and I'm actually going to put this on a local drive for this system and we're going to call this Alliance I'm going to give it one processor and two cores this varies per application. Uh, for this particular machine, I'm going to give it 4 gigs of RAM. I'm going to use bridged networking. I'm going to use an LSI Logic I.O. controller, but I am going to select SATA drive. I'll create a new virtual disk, and for this one, I'm going to give it 30 gigabytes. Let it split into virtual machines and accept the defaults. I will customize my hardware. I'm going to go to CD drive and tell it to use an ISO image. Now, the ISO image I'm going to select is on a network location, and it's going to warn me about that as I select it. So I'm going to say OK and close. It's going to give me the warning. I'm going to tell it I know that's OK, and we're going to finish. It's going to create my virtual machine container, and it should automatically open it for me. If it doesn't open it for me, we can always go here and go File, Open, and select our virtual machine. So for this machine, it already knows that it's using the uh, ISO at the network location. I'm just going to go ahead and power it on. And of course, I'm going to click in the virtual machine here. And I've already tested this media, so I know it's good. But I do advise that the first time after you've downloaded an ISO image that you do test the media the very first time. I've already tested this, so I'm going to tell it that I want to install. So you're going to notice a couple of things straight away. Number one, that this display does not fit properly. And number two, I've got this pop-up here. For our purposes, we're just going to go ahead and close this. I am uh, speaking English in the United States. I'm going to continue. I am going to go into the time and date. And I'm going to set an appropriate time and date for myself. I'm going to scroll down a little bit, and I'm going to do a software selection for this. I'm going to build an infrastructure server. Now, this is a machine that does not need a graphical user interface, but does have to be able to run applications now. So I'm going to select Infrastructure Server, and over here I'm going to customize the add-ons. Now, for this machine, I am going to want some debugging tools. I am going to want, in a corporate environment, a client for integration into a network managed by directory service, so I am going to install the directory service. Now, this machine is not going to do email or FTP. It's not going to serve any of these things out, but it is running under a hypervisor, so I'm going to install the agents for it. We'll scroll back up. I want some hardware and monitoring utilities. Now, this is not going to be an ID management server. I don't need InfiBand, uh, InfiniBand, sorry. I don't need Java. Uh, I will give it large systems performance just because I may expand this later. Um, I will be using NFS on these machines. I do want to be able to tune it. I'm not going to be printing. I'm not going to be doing any sort of uh, remote management, but I do want uh, SNMP, which is Simple Network Management Protocol. I won't be using it as a hypervisor because it is itself a virtual machine. I will do compatibility libraries. For this particular machine and for what I know I'm doing, I will install basic development tools, and that's because I know that some of the things I need to install later are going to require those, but this is not necessary in all environments. If you have a specific application installed, what you want to do is you want to look at its list of requirements. 
And if it needs development tools, then you'll give it development tools. Otherwise, you don't particularly need it. On this machine, I'm going to need it. I'm also going to want security tools. Uh, and I'm going to want some system administration tools. So I'm going to select that here, and I'm going to go to Done. Now, uh, KDump is enabled on this machine. For certain applications and certain secure environments, we don't want KDump, but for this one, I'm going to allow it. The network host and time, what I'm going to do is go into there, and I'm going to turn the interface on, and I'm going to give this system the name for my domain, and we're just going to call it Alliance. And if I want to, I can go in here and add some configuration details to it. Now, I know that I won't be using IPv6, so I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say ignore IPv6. I don't think I need to change anything else right now because I know that I do have a DHCP system running on my network and that it will automatically pull its own DHCP address. You may need to customize this for your needs. So after that, uh, it's going to go ahead. We're going to hit Done. And then after that, we're going to go uh, do a couple of interesting things. Number one, we're going to select our security profile. Now, the basic Internet security profile um, for some companies is going to be the CIS uh, benchmark. Now, this is a standard basic uh, benchmark for most systems. Uh, it meets most people's general needs. Now, there are other items here. If you scroll down, you see the little scroll bar here. If you scroll down, there are certain other profiles that you can select. And for a, a large company like a bank or something like that, I would uh, select a different profile. Now, in a very secure network like a government institution, DOD, military, that sort of thing, you're going to select DISA STIG. A company like a bank or if you're doing anything that might potentially have credit card information, that sort of thing on it, you're going to select PCI DSS. This is the minimum I would select for the average company's PCI DSS. Might be a little higher than you want or than you need, but uh, it's always better to go with uh, high and then back it down later. So we're going to select that profile and let it do whatever it's going to do here. It's going to add a couple of packages, etc., for selection and uh, check and make sure everything is laid out right. Now, for the PCI DSS compliance scan, there doesn't necessarily have to be any extra partitions on the hard drive, but for a very secure environment, or if you want to make a good secure system, we're going to want to go into our partitioning, and instead of selecting automatic partitioning, we're going to say, I will configure the partitioning. Then we're going to select Done, and now it's going to prompt me for a few things. So the disk layout will need to be done differently depending upon whether or not you're doing an EFI boot system or whether or not you're doing a old-fashioned BIOS boot system. For this one, we're going to do an old-fashioned BIOS boot system. Now, the first thing I want to do is make sure I gave it uh, available uh, 30 gigs. Okay, so it knows that's the drive. Now, this is the number we're going to pay attention to. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is add a partition. Now, this partition is going to be slash boot. And for this partition, I know that on a BIOS system, it only needs to be about 512 megabytes. And I'm going to tell it to add the partition. Now, <clears throat> I don't want it to be XFS. There are some problems with that XFS on a small scale system, so I want to actually change it to old-fashioned EXT. Okay, and this is going to be a standard partition. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down a little bit and I'm going to update the settings. I'm just going to log that one. The next thing I'm going to make for this is a root partition. Actually, I'll make a swap partition for this. Some systems if you're building virtual machines, you don't necessarily need a swap partition, and you kind of don't want a swap partition. What you want to do is assign the machine more RAM instead of using a swap partition. However, it will complain if you don't give it a swap partition. So for our needs here, I know I'm not really going to swap, so I'm going to give it just one gig of swap partition. Now it'll automatically label, label it a swap. Now it automatically gives it a volume group name. I like to modify that and I like to just call it VG0. That's because I, I just want it to be very small and very short. This is volume group zero and I know that. 
I'm going to name this lv.swap so I know that it's a logical volume. You don't have to do this. This is just an extra step. And I will scroll down, update my settings, and go to the next partition. The next partition we're going to lay out is going to be your primary root partition. For this machine, I'm going to go ahead and give it 12 gigs of RAM. Now you can get... Um, you can go as small as 7 gigs and as large as you need to, really, but for the most part, 12 gigs is a good number. This is going to say that it's an XFS. We're going to move it to EXT4. I'm going to call this LV.root just because I'm pedantic like that, and I'm going to update my settings. The next thing I'm going to add for security is going to be a slash temp partition, and I'm going to give that temp partition 2 gigabytes. The reason I'm going to do that is because some programs want to preload uh, information into your into your temp partition, and they're going to uh, and they're going to need to ac access that information as they do their installation. So we're going to give it that. We're also going to tell it we want it to be ext4. We're going to tell it it's a logical volume, and of course, it's automatically going to go to vg0. So we're going to update our settings. The next thing we're going to do is uh, give us a var partition. Var is where you put the variable information. And for the var partition on this system, we're going to give it 4 gigabytes. Var partition is very important. It's where logs get written. It's where uh, lots of critical information about the running state of the system get uh, installed. So we're going to update our settings there. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to give it a var log partition so that the logs the uh, for the system, for your message logs and things like that, are all going to go on their own separate partition. This one, I'm going to give this one another 2 gigabytes. I'm going to make this ext4, and I'm just going to call this lv.varlog. I do this uh, just for clarity for myself. Uh, and for my own personal sake later. The reason I'm creating these partitions is that if you do want to secure the system and you want to uh, prevent uh, the fill up, if you fill up your root partition, it can actually cause your system to stop processing. But um, if you uh, have excessive logs, etc., like uh, information because of a runaway process or something, we'll give it a separate partition and that will allow it room to run here. Uh, without filling up the root partition, um, and that will allow our system to still run, and then we'll still be able to log in later and access this. These are actually required partitions for certain higher security settings. So if you want to do a um, security content automated protocol setup, a SCAP or a STIG, which is required for defense cybersecurity, then you'll have to create these partitions. But if you're doing PCI DSS, you don't necessarily have to do all of them. But we're going to go ahead and do it as we would for any secure system. We're going to create the next partition, which is var log audit. Now, the audit logs are very important. If your machine gets compromised, you need to know what actually happened. Or if some runaway process uh, takes off and something unexpected happens, you need to know what happened. If you have a, a user who's doing something perhaps untoward, you need to know what happened. So you want to turn up your audit logs. Uh, hackers and or crackers can sometimes compromise a system and hide their tracks by filling up the audit log space. So we're going to secure that later, but what we're going to do first is make sure that we have a separate location for our audit logs. And for this, we're going to give it four gigabytes. That's because I will expect it to um, build quite a large number of logs. Now, I can go into a lot of detail about that, about how you want to send your logs off, about how you want to take care of it. You can customize this almost infinitely. You can say that I only want to keep one day of logs and I want to ship all of them off to a, a different server, etc. Um, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but we're going to call this lv.var log or var audit. Okay, new security requirements require us to actually have a separate var temp partition. Uh, software doesn't really use this a whole lot anymore, so we're going to give it 2 gigabytes. I'm going to switch it to ext4.
Okay, and then the last one we need to add is a home partition. Now, if we're in a corporate environment and we want to have a centrally mounted home directory, which is what you should do if you have an established Unix environment, we'd make this very small. We'd only make this about 512 megabytes because we're going to mount over top of it off of a central file share. Some environments don't have a central file share. So users end up having their own individual home directories and they all end up residing on slash home. So what I'm going to do is give it a separate slash home partition. And for that, I'm going to add the rest of the disk space, which is 255. You can see it down below 0.97. We're going to go ahead and add that. <clears throat> also going to make it ext4. We're going to call it lv.home. And we're going to update our settings. Now these are mandatory if you're going to do high security stuff. Um, other file systems you might consider adding or other partitions you might considering, uh, consider adding would be a slash OPT for optional software partitions. You might want to consider doing that instead of putting this space into slash home. If you have uh, NFS home directories, you might want to go ahead and just use the rest of the space, the other two gigs left over for the OPT partition. But after we're finished with that, we're going to check this, make sure everything's good. We're going to say uh, we're finished here. We're going to accept our changes and let it lay out the disk. Security policy is going to tell me everything is OK. I'm going to look through here and make sure I don't have any problems. And then what I'm going to do is kick it off and let it begin its installation. While it's doing its installation, I'm going to set a root password. This is a temporary root password. Of course, we'll change it later on. And then I'll set a user up here. Uh, just so I can log in as myself and do things through sudo. And I am going to make myself an administrator. We'll pick, uh, I'm use this. Now, if I were using uh, centralized authentication like Active Directory or IPA, uh, Red Hat Identity Manager, something like that, I would need I wouldn't really need to go into a lot of detail. But for here, what I want to do is on this machine, I know it's going to be a local user only. I'm going to move his uh, user IDs and his group ID up a little bit. I'm going to allow it to be in the wheel group. This is all uh, customizable. This is this is uh, acceptable for a small home or a small network. But once you get into a corporate environment, all of your uh, user accounts, etc., are generally centralized. So after that, we're going to say done. We're going to let it go ahead and finish its installation, and uh, we'll get back to you when it's, uh, when it's finished. Okay, so when the installation is finished, we're going to reboot the system. I'm going to press F3 so I can see the boot up process. One of the things I forgot to mention is that because I am making this uh, a virtual machine, I did not encrypt the volume group on the drive. That's very important to note. That if you require encryption at rest on a physical machine, you would want to do that. But if you're using encrypted storage on your back end, you don't necessarily have to. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and log in here. Now, I need to do a couple of things to secure this system first. It's not going to have a GUI, so I can't use SCAP Workbench very easily on here. First thing I'm going to do is V-I-S-U-D-O, V-I sudo, and I'm going to open the sudoers file. Now, I'm going to type slash wheel, W-H-E-E-L, and I'm going to press enter. That's going to take me down to the line here on the page. You can see it is where... People in the group wheel are allowed to run all admin commands. Now I want to press 0 to go to the beginning of the line. I'm going to press I so that I can insert. And then I want to press Shift 3 or pound sign or hash mark. And that's going to make that a comment. So I'm going to insert a pound mark there. I'm going to hit the escape button. I'm going to press J a couple of times. And I'm going to go down to this line right here where it says the same thing without a password, right? That's what I want. I want to do it without a password. <clears throat> this is actually insecure, and I'm only doing this because I want to show you how to actually run the SCAP Workbench tool on this machine to make sure that it's secure 
and to do some remediation. So I'm going to press X here, and that's going to delete the hash mark. Once I've deleted the hash mark or the comment or the pound sign, I'm going to hit Escape. I'm going to hold Shift and press the colon button. Or uh, Once it puts the colon on the screen there, I'm going to hit WQ for write and quit. And that is going to write and quit that file. Now I'm going to back out of the root account. And the first thing I'm going to do is generate a secure SSH key. So I'm going to do SSH dash key gen, K-E-Y-G-E-N dash T space R-S-A space dash B 4096. I'm going to make this a strong key, 4096 bits of entropy. And uh, that's going to be kind of hard to crack. So I'm going to hit enter. It's going to do my thing here now it is a good idea to uh, make sure you know where you're putting this we're going to put up the id rsa uh, it's also a good idea to do a passphrase for this today i'm not going to do a passphrase i'm just going to hit enter and so from there i'm going to cd into my dot ssh directory i'm going to list the files and i'm going to cat the id rsa dot pub into a file i'm going to do a double redirect there i'm going to put it in the file called authorized keys i'm doing is dumping the contents of the pub file into the authorized key file so i'm going to say anybody's got this key is allowed to log into this box now the first thing you're going to notice here is that <coughs> because of my umask which is my uh, default write permissions, which is actually kind of insecure. You can see other people have the ability to read and write that file. Well, that's insecure, and because of that, SSH is not going to work right. So what we have to do is we have to run the change mode command, chmod 600. So that means we want to be able to read and write it, and we don't want anybody else to have access to everything in that directory. And then we're going to list those files and make sure it took uh, effect. And it sure did. It changed our permissions there. So now we know that's secure. Now to test it, we're going to find out what our IP address is. And uh, I'm going to do IPA. And then here I'm going to go SSH 192.168.1.70. Uh, it's going to ask me if I want to accept it. Yes, of course I do. And of course, because my permissions are correct, it let me write in. Here I am logged into the system via SSH. So now I'm back out of SSH. Knowing that SSH works remotely is absolutely glorious. Now, the next thing I want to do, go back to my home directory. And uh, I am going to have to install some packages if I want to secure this machine. First of all, we'll look at our disk layout, see how everything looks. We've got all of our proper volumes there as they should be. Now, I want to be able to get from my network storage area, I want to be able to get my ISO file. I know I'm going to need that if I'm going to, um, if I'm going to set up a Red Hat repository so that I can install extra packages to this, which weren't part of the default install. So I need to get uh, the original ISO install file for this machine. And the way I'm going to do it is just to mount it up to slash media. So for my use case, here we go. We're going to do sudo mount 192.168.1.111 vm share to mnt. I'm going to clear my screen now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount dash o loop mnt media. I think it's called, uh, let's see what the file is out here. It's called rel server 79. There we go. I'm going to mount that up as a loop. I'm going to mount it to slash media partition. Now that it's mounted up, what I want to do is I want to copy files from it. So I want to cp media media.repo to etsy yum.repos.d and I want to call it local.repo. I want to change permissions on it. 644 on etsy.yum.repos.d local repo. I'm going to edit that file, and I'm going to use VI for it. You can use whatever editor you want.
So here I need to add a couple of things to it. The first thing I'm going to add is I want to enable it. So I'm going to put in enabled equals one. I'm going to tell it where the base URL is, the universal resource lo locator. I'm going to tell it to find it in a file, and that is base URL equals file, colon. That is media. Right there is where it's going to find it. And our GPG key is GPG key equals file, Etsy, PKI, RPM, GPG, capital RP and GPG key, red hat, release. Now, note that this is uh, has GPG checked to zero, but that should get changed later on when we apply our security profile. So with that, we're going to do a yum clean all. And then we're going to do a... Uh, yum install dash y scat workbench and scat security guide scat stands for security content automation protocol it's going to go ahead and it's going to install the packages and its dependencies And now they will be installed. Now from this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a different machine. And that's because to use the SCAP workbench, I'm going to uh, use a GUI. OK, now I'm going to try to remote from this system, Nighthawk, into the virtual machine that I just set up over there. So I'm going to open up a terminal. I'm going to SSH. See if it's going to let me in. Yes, it will. It's going to prompt me for the password. I'm going to go ahead and log in. Okay, that looks really good. Now, from here, what I want to do is I want to copy my SSH key from here over to there. So I want to do SSH copy ID to It's going to ask me for my password. I'm going to give it in. It's going to copy my key over there. Now, next time I go to SSH to that machine, I just up arrow twice. It should let me in. Boing, without a password. Okay. Now, this machine has SCAP Workbench installed, and so does the remote machine. So from here, I'm just going to run SCAP Workbench. Remember, this is running on my local system. It's going to ask me what content I want to load, and I'm going to load Red Hat 7, RHEL 7. I'm going to say load our content. Here we have some options. Okay, now we don't have a customization file yet. We can do this later. This gets very complicated. The first thing I want to do is select what profile I want to go with. For a very high security environment, like a government institution where you have to have a clearance, et cetera, to get in there. You're going to use something called the DISA STIG uh, for uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. This has uh, 252 things that it checks. For uh, a good sized company, something like a bank or, say, um, you know, a, a place that might handle credit card information or anything like that, what we want to do is we want to do a PCI DSS. This is a pretty good compliance, so we're going to select that. And since I'm not going to check my local machine, I'm going to do it over SSH. I'm going to tell it I want to use meatbag at 2.168.1.70, port 22. I am a sudoer. And what it's going to do is it's going to remote into that other virtual machine and it's going to scan it and see how its security profile was set up from the get-go. So I'm just going to hit scan. I'm not going to mess with any other settings on here right now. I'm just going to hit scan. This can take a while. And as it scans the remote machine, you're going to get a dialog here that pops open. It's going to give you some diagnostic information. 
We're going to get some more things that are going to pop up in here. And this is going to take a bit of time to run, as you can see. The first thing that it has to do is verify the integrity, the cryptographic hash of all the system uh, files. And so that's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to have to crunch. So we'll get back to you here in just a minute. OK, so that we'll see that when it's finished, the processing has finished. And we can go ahead and close this. We did get a few more messages here, obtrusive data, et cetera. These can be caused by various things that are outside the scope of this right now. We're not even going to bother with it. So we're just going to hit that. And we're going to go take a look at the results. Our results here look pretty darn good. Um, there are a few things that, uh, that it, it has complained about. We can expand these. Okay, and uh, timeout intervals, a few other things like that. Now, what we can do is we can go into detail. We can fix these ourselves if we want before we save this as a template, or we can generate a remediation role if we're doing Ansible, if we're doing Puppet, or if we're doing Bash. Um, we can show the report. It's going to start up Firefox here on my desktop and give you a nice little uh, display, etc. Your compliance where you're at. Two high severity items here that have failed. Permissions there, GPG check, etc. These guys uh, need to be remediated. So we'll go ahead and close that. If we want to remediate, we can uh, clear that and we can say go ahead and remediate it and um, do it again. And it will go out and do a remediation scan where it will actually fix those items that it found if in fact it can. Um, so it's going to run that. We're going to get the same uh, window is going to pop up. We're going to get some more information. It's going to go out and it's going to try to remediate those issues on that remote machine. So we're going to let it go ahead and run.